You want to do the record button? All good. Okay. All right. We're recording now. So, Bill, why don't you get started? Can everybody please mute ourselves? I think that's everybody but me. Good evening, everybody, and, and welcome to tonight's presentation on Beyond Killer Drones. We have uh, our illustrious guest tonight, Kathy Kelly, who's sitting here. We're so happy to have her here and that all of you could join us tonight and we get to uh, hear a firsthand account and experience of, uh, of her experiences of studying what uh, we've been doing with our war experiences overseas. Um, it's something that's insanely important that we start to become much more aware of, uh, especially for those of us that live out here in the Fox Valley. We don't uh, hear much about this or talk about it. Uh, we probably do hear about it, but it becomes one of those things, uh, like so many in our collective unconscious, that just kind of like we prefer to think it's not there, so we don't talk about it. So it's important that we do, and that's what we're going to start tonight, the conversation for our larger communities with our presentation uh, from Kelly. Uh, from Kathy, <laughs> reading your last name. All right, Kathy, would you uh, ready to well, thank proceed? You. Okay. Thank you very much to the Geneva Unitarian Universalist Society for your care and concern about this issue and to Bill who got in touch with me and has very patiently worked with me. And then also Jean who created a PowerPoint to enable us to move, I hope smoothly, through a presentation. And I'm so pleased to see each of you. Um, please don't hesitate to stop me if um, I'm talking too fast or too soft or um, say something that is really, really puzzling. Um, and uh, I also hope that each of you will be well and uh, want, to, want you to know that you'd be very welcome to get in touch with me anytime. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, one of our friends from the Catholic Worker Movement, Jim Forrest, uh, died a few days ago. And in some of the most recent conversations I'd had with him, he really strongly encouraged appealing to artwork, artwork throughout history, to images that can sometimes help us examine our own present time. So I've been trying to do that lately. And for me, it's been quite helpful. And I'm no art historian. I don't even know if I pronounce things properly. But uh, one of the pictures, one of the images that's been on my mind a great deal comes from 1564. It's uh, an artistic rendition by Peter Bruegel. He saw, I think he should be called Peter Bruegel the Elder. And thank you, Jean, for showing that. You know, it was unusual in his time to portray the military as a group that was doing something sinister, but this was a pogrom in a small village during an icy winter time. You can see icicles and the, the horses are tethered, but that was the upper hand militarily at that time. If you had horses, who could outrun you? Who could go past you? And then you see that the soldiers are kicking in doors. They're enacting a very horribly violent scene. You can see on the left-hand side in a doorway, a baby. You see in the middle, a woman holding a baby on her lap. Uh, it's a pretty terrifying scene. Interestingly, um, the emperor, Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, knew that this Flemish painter's paintings were very, very important. And he wanted to display the painting, but he didn't want to make it seem like the military were sinister, much less that they slaughtered babies. And so he had another crew of painters cover over the scenes of slaughtered children or children that people were trying to smuggle and make the children look like like birds or bundles of food, um, something that would make it seem like, okay, these soldiers were engaging with plunder, but they weren't massacring innocents. So the title of this picture is The Massacre of the Innocents. And in our time, in our contemporary time, I think 
the most apt counterpart to the horses that get the upper hand as a weapon, basically, would be aerial attacks. If you can get the capacity to wage aerial attacks against your opponents, uh, it doesn't mean you'll win a war, but it does certainly give a significant upper hand. And the other reason I think Bruegel's painting is so important for us is the, the issue of cover-up, of denial, of trying to pretend it didn't happen. And this has a great deal to do with the matter of drone warfare and drone attacks in our time. So um, I, I wanna welcome the people who just joined us. Thank you so much for coming together. And I had begun this presentation by saying that um, a mentor of mine strongly advised appealing to art uh, as a way to understand our experiences. So we just looked at a painting by Peter Brugel, the, the elder of Flemish painting from the 16th century. And, and another painting I'd like to refer to is called the 3rd of May, 1808, by the painter Francisco Goya. And again, this is a bit unusual for its time because the innocent victim, the person who's not part of any kind of a military group is at the center and he's illuminated and he certainly looks like a character that we want to identify with. Maybe even his hands extended could resemble Jesus on the cross. And you see the bloody figures nearby and the military people almost seem like a, you know, one big unit, like a spider, uh, aiming their guns at an innocent person. And Goya was protesting a Napoleonic raid on a small village where there had been an insurrection the night before, but the victims portrayed here are innocent of any crime at that particular moment. And so uh, it seems like the idea of focusing on the human being, telling the human story, I really believe that stories are our number one way to understand the realities we face. So I'd like to tell you a little bit of my own personal story in becoming involved with drones. We have a friend, Jeremy Scahill, who writes for the website, The Intercept. And Jeremy is so, so astute and perceptive. And he had been with a number of us while we were in Iraq, just in the days leading up to the uh, shock and awe bombing of Iraq. And so it, anytime he came through Chicago, he had a brother there. We'd say, oh, Jeremy, come and visit us. So he was in the kitchen at Voices for Creative Nonviolence, an apartment in the uptown area where I lived for many years and worked with others. And you know there were pleasantries, but then Jeremy, next thing I knew, he was pounding our kitchen table and he was agitated. And he said, Kathy, when are you and the others going to adjust to the realities of 21st century warfare? And I, I was flummoxed. I didn't know what he was talking about. We're we trying our best. And, and then he started to talk about predators and reapers and MQ-9s and drone aircraft and unmanned aerial vehicles. And I thought, oh, I need to do some research and do it quick. So, you know, Jeremy was going down the staircase and I was at the computer looking up all of these they're pretty new vocabulary words for me from the military uh, annals and began to realize just how much havoc was being created by drone attacks. And it, has seemed to us in all these years of work with voices and because of mentors like Jan and David Hartsoe really, that when you learn of people who are suffering from uh, attacks that they can't escape, it's a good idea to try to be alongside them and learn from them in person. It's not always possible, but when it is possible, we find that uh, where you stand determines what you see. So um, we also have a very good friend in Chicago, Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid. And we were doing a 2008 walk from Chicago all the way up to Minneapolis, Minnesota for the um, Republican National Convention. That was a very long walk. I think my feet stopped hurting in November of that year. But anyway, we asked Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid to send us off to give us uh, his blessing. 
And he's done that before. And it's always been a wonderful sense of union and solidarity. But this time he said from the Federal Building Plaza in Chicago, I'm going to say something that may be very hard for all of you to hear. He said, in all of these years, we've watched you pay so much attention to Iraq and also to the West Bank and to Lebanon. That why is it you've never in all these years paid attention to what is happening in Pakistan and neighboring Afghanistan? So we had a long walk and many, many evenings to research and consider and talk about what we could do. And so we decided we'd work on sending a delegation to Pakistan. And in that delegation were our good friend, Jesuit priest, Steve Kelly, and uh, Razia Ahmed from the Midwest, and also um, several voices activists and Jean Stoltz, was, who uh, was a founder of what is now called the community peacemaker teams, and it was the Christian peacemaker teams. And we went to Pakistan with a list of people we wanted to visit. And we said, you know, mainly we want to try to find out from people who've been victims of drone attacks. And so we found ourselves at one point with um, a journalist who had come a long way to come and visit us. He was a Pakistani journalist. And he told us stories we had heard before from um, people in various villages, stories about how, you know, the, the code of hospitality in Pakistan was that if somebody knocks on the door and they want water or they want food and they're in a remote area, you can't say, well, Hotel Six is that way or, you know, the 7-Eleven is over there. The, the code is, I mean, this was in Jesus time. If somebody knocks at the door, check it out. Are, are people obeying the code? And so people would give hospitality, but that could become so very, very dangerous in areas of Pakistan where the people knocking at the door might be considered high value targets, might be followed by drone surveillance. And when they walk away, you could be the next target. So we heard stories like that, but this journalist was telling us that, you know, people's bodies, the force of the explosions would rearrange people's bodies, that their limbs would be broken, their organs would be destroyed, that um, people would be carrying those who had survived, you know, bloodied and bludgeoned and trying to get them to safety, which was very far away and healthcare and first aid was inaccessible. And so then he asked me, Kathy, do people in your country know about the consequences of these drones. And I said, well, uh, within universities and some church groups, there really is a, a growing awareness. And he said, well, that's not really my question. He said, what I'm asking you is, do your news reports, your regular mainstream news reports, tell people in the United States about these drone attacks? And what could I say? But no. And then he asked me, where is your democracy? Where is your democracy? And I found that to be an important mantra to keep asking myself, you know, democracy is based on education. And if most people don't know, then how can people make choices appropriate to the terrible, terrible, conditions caused by our wars and our drone attacks. So uh, the next thing I'd like to tell you about is a, a follow-up trip in which we went to Afghanistan to try again to learn about people who had been affected by drone attacks. And oh gosh, that was in 2010 and Afghanistan in winter can be such a harsh place. And people who've been displaced by now 40 years of war, you know, their livestock are thirsting or their crops have failed or their villages have been bombed or they've already sustained one drone attack. They go to these horrible refugee camps. Uh, the one that I wanna tell you about was called Charahi Kambar. And it was winter and it was cold and people were burning tires and plastic bags trying to get warmth and they never had 
enough food and these mud structures became slimy and, and you slipped everywhere you went. And, and then we met a man who said that he was from the Bordak province. His name was uh, Juma and his spouse and five of his children were killed in a drone attack. And he showed us pictures of each one, small kind of like passport photo pictures. And then we went inside the tent of the uncle of his children. And the uncle went over to a little nine-year-old girl. Her name was Guljuma. And he unzipped her jacket. And Jean, maybe you could show a photo. I'm sorry, Jean, before that, before that. Oh, Jean, you're muted. Could you go to the beginning of the PowerPoint? Um, uh, I don't I don't have that photo. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I'm I'm sure that's my fault. Okay. I was going to show you a photo of me sitting next to this little girl. I'm bundled up in a warm gray coat, scribbling notes. And the little girl, you can see there's no arm in the sleeve of her light jacket. And that arm had been ripped off, torn off by a drone attack. And, um, you know, I don't know what happened to that girl, but I know that an armless mutilated young girl would face a very, very difficult future. And next to her was her brother, but he was kind of in a, uh, a fetal position and he was shaking and shivering and I don't think it was just the cold. Apparently his pain from his leg having been mutilated was so bad that at times they would give him morphine and there was a thought that he might have been someone who had become addicted to the opium. So, so that was one of my introductions to the um, extremely difficult circumstances the consequences of drone warfare that that Pakistani journalist wanted me to understand. I can certainly tell you that I saw some of the best surveillance possible happening in Kabul. I kind of, I say I, I know Kabul to a keyhole. Really in 27 visits, I always went to the same neighborhood and stayed within a six block radius, uh, you know, in one place or another, kids were always moving. Um, but I learned late at night through stories about many other places and circumstances. And my young friends particularly felt an, identi an identification with widows who were trying to raise children under really uh, terrible circumstances of privation. Um, one of my young friends remembered late one night, a night in the Bamiyan province when it was so cold and their widowed mother, the dad had been killed by the Taliban, had, um, you know, wanted to provide warmth, but just, you know, only had a couple blankets. And so one brother fell asleep and the other brother, it was about two in the morning, thought I could just pull that blanket and cover myself and maybe I can warm up. And when he pulled the blanket off the sleeping brothers, the sleeping brother awoke and those two brothers in their fear and their rage got into a huge fight over the blanket and one tried to suffocate the other. And so my young friend Abdul Hai carried that story all through his life. Well, those brothers and their sister and quite a few others devised a project in Kabul wherein they created a survey and then they did their surveillance. They went up the icy mountainsides. There's no road, it's really hard. You're just <gasps> utterly breathless when you get to the top. And, and then they would sit in the hovels and the huts of widows primarily from Kabul or often displaced from other places. And they would ask, Madame, how many times a week does your family eat beans? And write down the answer. And could you tell us what is your source of water? And how far do you have to walk up the mountain or down to get the water? And please tell us what is your rent? And what is your income? And who earns the income? And if the income earner 
was less than 12 years of age, that survey went to the top. That's the kind of surveillance we need. Those are the kinds of questions that ought to be asked. And our young friends would then go back down the mountain and they devised a really ingenious project. And thank you, Jean, for showing these pictures now. It was called the Duvet Project. And they would uh, make sure that the, the widows would get the green synthetic fleece that you see in the bottom middle portion of your screen. And then that would be stuffed inside of coverlets. And I swear every woman I ever met in Afghanistan knew exactly how to make these. And it would be sewn up and these could save lives. Uh, then the coverlets would be connected, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, collected and loaded up on a very wobbly truck. And then they would be distributed free of charge in the refugee camps. And on the upper left-hand side, you see Bulimai and Ali trying so hard to make sure that this is going to be organized. And there's Abdul Hai and Ali, and in the lower right-hand corner, their young friend Sumaya. And um, I saw this project happen probably seven years in a row. And they also developed a school for the street kids so that they could begin to um, kind of transition beyond being child laborers and earn an, earn an income for their families. Now, this, this is in pretty stark contrast to the drone surveillance. The footage that's collected by the drone cameras is ostensibly being assembled in order to determine patterns of life in places like Afghanistan. But they didn't communicate what you were just seeing. The patterns of life had to do with people that were deemed to be often by faulty intelligence threats by virtue of being high value targets. But even during the Obama years, the signature strikes, it's like ra racial profiling in neighborhoods in our country. If you were of a certain age and you were male and you were Muslim, that was enough to be suspected of being a threat to the people in the United States. And so there were many, many wrongful attacks. There was one that had happened in February of 2010, which I, I, I just always need to remind myself of. You know, and for me, the idea of you know, leaving my home and going downtown was not, not a big deal. But for women in the Daikondi province of Afghanistan, that would be like a once a year event, if ever. And on this particular day, a caravan of three, I'm sorry, a caravan of three cars filled with women and grandmothers and their children was going to travel through the Uruzgan province to a huge market in Kabul and then take the grandmothers and the babies to see doctors. So people were very, very, very excited. I mean, this, this was like going to the moon for these women. And as it happened, as they were traveling along a mountain road in the Uruzgan province, paratroopers from the United States landed on a mountainside and the drones trying to make sure that they would be protected detected the caravan. And they said, you know, this could be, the word that's often used in military parlance is nefarious. And so I asked Bill to help us uh, see this particular footage. It comes from a film that was made um, by Sonia Kennebec called National Bird. And I think some in your congregation might have seen this before, but for me, it's worth watching again. Uh, this is five or six minutes of what um, is reenacted based on the footage of the drone camera and then uh, the actual transcript, which you could also read in the Los Angeles Times from 2010. So thank you, Bill, for showing us this photo footage. I'm going Sorry, to uh, share my screen now. Well, I believe I'm getting close. 
There we go. We are sharing the screen. Bill, did you hit the sound? Apparently not. So, I'm going to try one more time. Thank you, Bill. Oh, I'm going to try one more time here. You are. Share a screen, share a sound. Working. Bullshit, where? Send me a yes. fucking bill. I don't think they have kids out of this hour. I know they're shady, but come on. They're reviewing. They review that shit. Why do you think possible, child? Why are they so quick to call a fucking kid, but not to call a fucking rifle? I really doubt that children call, man. I really fucking hate that. Think they have a third vehicle on their train. Guilty by association. They're praying. They are praying. Praying. I mean, seriously, that's what they do. They're gonna do something nefarious. I mean, the money came out of the like cycle, and I'm going to pull it out of پایین چیدی همه در نماز داده شیدی زن و مردم نماز رو خندی از اونجا که حرکت کردیم دیگه همی صدای بونگک در گوش ما می آمد ولی خوچ ازی که هوا علوده بود دیده نمی شود اما صدای شد ما می شدید چیز بود رنگی سیار سیادش یکی دیگه سفید بودم تا بینگ او بینگ می زدم تا بینگ می زد دور دور انتا دار می خورد اینه که ما برها برها شنیدیم که امی تیاری به پیلوت که در هوا میگشته او بسیار به فضای بلند به شب تاریک او خب ما دل ما نمینجه درد داره که تو برای دیگه چیزای دیگه مثلا تو فرق مو کنی که مثلا این سوزن هست این مرچه هست ولی برای ما انسان هایی که مثلا کلی گشت در دکسان سوار بود که دکسان اون در بایدیش سوار بود کدام پنایی هم نیسته که تو از بالا بگیم مثلا من ندیدم کلی در بایدیش سوار بودم تو ندیدی که همه ایش مسافر هستم همه ایش زن باشه هستم ادلسن نیر در ریر در ایس یوزی بایل کنیش کنیم پایت پیک اپ ای ویپن و یک کمبتن این هایی در ایس Jack 25, Kirk 97, be advised. All packs are finishing up praying and rallying up near all three vehicles at this time. Oh, sweet target. I try to go for the bed, but it's right dead center of the pack. Oh, that'd be perfect. And Jack 25, our screeners are currently calling 21 military age males, no females, and two possible children. How copy? Roger. When we say children, we talking teenagers or toddlers? I would say about 12, not toddlers. Something more towards adolescent or teenage. We'll pass that along to the ground for you, Commander. But like I said, 12, 13 years old with a weapon, this is dangerous. Oh, we agree, yeah. What's the master plan, fellas? I don't know. I hope we get to shoot the truck with all the dudes in it. Yeah. Center is in, but the party begins. Alright, so the plan is, man, uh, we're gonna watch this thing go down. The helos are gonna take out as much as they can, and when they Winchester, we can play cleanup. AMC. Yep. Remember, kill chain. Will do. Roger. سافرین بس دوار خطا شدیم دیگه پایان شدیم دیگه بس ماشین هر استاد کردیم پایان شدیم بس پایان شدیم بس ماشین نیدون بالا رزد بس موم سیاسرا که گفتا مردا گفتا که می سیاسرا بدر شنا نمیزنا 
یا نمیزنه باز ما سی سی اثر بودیم بدر شدیم که ام زد Andrew Coburn, writing for the London Review of Books, pointed out that it later became apparent that what the drone operators and the analysts thought were weapons were actually turkeys that the families were bringing for their relatives in Kabul. You know, the drones, they just don't have the capacity uh, even on a clear day, even flying low, uh, to, to see the images clearly. And so a person is more like, you know, a, a blob and, and a vehicle is, is, is a, you know, grainy, bigger blob. You can't, you can't discern. Nevertheless, those kinds of attacks were very, very routine. And um, under the successive presidential administrations have been kept away from the public view by and large. You know, during the withdrawal of troops from Kabul, uh, there was a remarkable coverage. There was more coverage during that six day stretch than there had been in the previous 20 years of the United States war in Afghanistan. So, um, you know, people just don't know so much about the consequences and the drones are being sold to Saudi Arabia. The Saudis are using them in Yemen. Uh, and now the Yemenis have gotten their own drones that they have acquired through 3D um, images, possibly given to them by Iran. They've now begun to manufacture drones. You could almost talk about the democratization of warfare because you don't have to be a state actor, a non-state actor, a, a, a group of people can acquire drones and we can anticipate accelerated usage of these drones using more and more dangerous weapons. So um, when the United States was withdrawing from Afghanistan, there was of course the terrible attack in Kabul at the Hamikata International Airport when 13 United States Marines were killed and as many as 170 Afghan civilians. So in the ensuing days, the United States was very, very intent on finding who did this terrible attack and preventing a next one. And that was a context in which, you know, all who were involved were working. It, appears that in that kind of context, there is more of a likelihood of something called confirmation bias. And by that is meant the idea that people are looking to find a target and then it, you know, it will seem that one particular car or person or house might be connected to 
a group like the Islamic State in the Khorasan province, ISKP or ISIS or some kind of radical insurgent group. And then every next bit of evidence that comes in is sort of added to that initial sort of presumption of guilt. There's no evidence-based trial. The, the people operating the drones actually become the prosecutor, the jury, and the executioner. So on August 29th, um, a, a man named Zamari Ahmed had um, he had a really enviable job in many ways. This is him in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Samari Ahmadi was working for an, an NGO called the Nutrition Education International. He'd worked with them for six years. They're based in San Francisco. Um, and, I'm sorry, they're based in California. I'm not sure it's San Francisco, San Diego, I think. And um, he was eligible for one of these very, very valuable um, visas, which people could get if they worked for the United States and could prove it. And so his bags and the bags of his immediate family members were packed and in the hallway. And he anticipated that on August 30th, he would be going to the airport, showing the papers, get through the crowd, get on the plane and go to the United States. So on his last day in Kabul, Zamari had all kinds of tasks on his task list. And I can tell you that in all the visits I made to Kabul, to my working class area, where, which was not far from where Zamari Ahmadi lived, only once did I ever meet someone who owned a car. Owning a car was a really big deal. And if you owned a car, there was a lot of likelihood that colleagues and friends in your own family would be saying, hey, could you do this? Do you mind? And so Zamari Ahmadi had been asked to pick up his boss's computer and bring it to him. And he did that. And the computer was in a black case like computers often are. And for his family members and its big extended family, he was asked to pick up big canisters of water. And he did that. And another colleague needed to be dropped off to get to work. And another one needed to be picked up. So he was busy all day long. And the Ahmadi family had a tradition. When dad drove into the courtyard, kind of like a driveway, then all the kids would come out because he would let one of the older children, one of the boys, park the car. And then all the others would laugh and point. And it was just a nice tradition. So Zamari Ahmadi was being followed for eight hours on his last day in Kabul. And a drone had followed him and the analyst saw the computer he'd picked up and he was driving a white Corolla similar to what was driven by the suicide bomber who attacked the airport. And that suicide bomber apparently had a black case. And so there's Zamari Ahmadi in a white Corolla with a black case. And then when he picked up the canisters of water and gingerly placed them in his car, the confirmation bias that, oh, those guys, those are explosives. And so the report was being developed that, you know, this is a terrorist. And if we don't take him out, he could kill many, many more people. And when he drove into his driveway, there were actually two-year-olds visible for two minutes. But at that point, the decision was made uh, it's inscrutable to me that the sound, the command impact was given, and the missile fired, the Hellfire missile fired by a Reaper drone, it basically lands 100 pounds of molten lead on the target. So the car is burning, but then almost like a lawnmower, these um, blades jut out and start to rotate so that it's sort of an extra assurance of destruction. And I, it's possible that that's the kind of missile, the Hellfire missile that was fired on that particular evening. The children had come out to meet their dad 
and uh, 10 people in the Ahmadi family were killed. Three of them were toddlers. And Jean, if we could just go back to the photos. So we're looking at Zamari Ahmadi, his son, Zamir, his next oldest son, Faisal, and his son, Fazad. Benjamin and Arsin were the sons of his brother. And the brother, all, he, the brother was a military commander, and he also hoped to go to the United States. And the little girls were part of the extended family, Hayat, and then the twins, Samaya and Marika. So it's so important that we don't look away. Uh, the New York Times recently published a video of the actual attack. You can see through the drone camera, the actual attack on the Ahmadi family, but it's a much longer video. I strongly encourage you though to um, go to the New York Times and find that. And um, General Sami Saeed of the United States Air Force was tasked with writing a report on this particular attack. And his conclusion, which was supported by General Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, was that no wrongdoing was done. And that conclusion is reached, General Sami Said says, because of the context. He says, you know, you just have to look at the context in which we were working. But I refute that. I think we must look at the wider context, the broader context, the longer context, which would show us that this attack against the Ahmadi family was unusual only in the fact that international media covered it. Otherwise, these kinds of attacks have been routine. And the civilian casualty files that Asmat Khan created for the New York Times after five years of research and filing Freedom of Information Act uh, requests and even suing the Pentagon show again and again and again that the military has not acted in the fog of war out of confusion, that this is a record of impunity. And I think the person who gives the most compelling witness to that is a man named Daniel Everett Hale. Daniel Everett Hale was a drone analyst for the Air Force. And he, in his job both for the Air Force and then subsequently for a military contracting company, began to realize that nine out of 10 times, the intelligence was faulty and or the wrong person was targeted and nine out of 10 times civilians were killed. Now he identified through um, a government document tra tra tracking Operation Haymaker that these were US statistics. And he finally as an act of conscience disclosed those US military statistics to none other than Jeremy Scahill, whom I mentioned in the beginning. And um, that was a very brave act on the part of Daniel Everett Hale. He was um, discovered by the US, he was prosecuted, and he is um, now in the Marion Federal Penitentiary for a four year sentence. And Jean, maybe we could show that photo of Daniel Hale. And when he was um, being sentenced, that's Daniel Hale in the upper part of the photo. And, and I, I think it's important to, reckon with that photo, because underneath you see people, just beautiful people wafting down the street, utterly unaware of Daniel Hale. But Daniel Hale said at the sentencing to the judge, I stole papers because I could no longer steal what it was not mine to take, precious human lives. So I feel like I want Daniel Hale to be my mentor um, these drone policies are continually made in secret, and our country doesn't very often discuss them. Uh, the over-the-horizon policy still in effect for Afghanistan 
now has drones and un, well, the unmanned aircraft, drones, missiles, and manned aircraft stationed in what they call over the horizon bases in Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, and in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. So that always, if the United States determines that there is a viable target who is a threat to the United States, then the missiles can be fired. Meanwhile, Afghanistan is under a state of siege as people are facing starvation, thirsting to death, without medicines, without food, without water, without employment in a brutal, brutal punishment of innocent people in Afghanistan. Now, I think it's very important to recognize that um, the United States military, after the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, did not in a discernible way that we can see in terms of weapon preparation, war preparation, sit down, lean back, take stock, try to assess the consequences. Instead, there has been a race to move on to the next war. And I don't know where that war will be. I hope it won't be. But one thing that's very clear is that the United States is constantly, uh, through the Pentagon and the State Department, kind of flashing what some call the China card, building, stoking fears of China as a threat that must be dealt with by taking from the US taxpayers even more money to buy more weaponry, more sophisticated weaponry, more expensive weaponry. This is wonderful news for the weapon contractors, for the military contractors. You know, now they can start to make more money. And a, a man named Admiral Charles Richard has said that in the event of a military engagement with China, recourse to nuclear weaponry would become a probability, not a possibility. We are crossing the nuclear threshold with weaponry that's one soft grade, software upgrade away from becoming thoroughly autonomous and talking about how because of the war games that have been played with China in simulations and because the US keeps losing because China does have very good equipment and very good skills, that the way to win such an entanglement could mean the US has to use the nuclear bomb. So this is a very chilling, a very frightening reality. And so I, I think often about the end of World War I, when so many people all around the world said, never again, we never want to go into another world war. 91 million people have lost their lives. We won't do it again. I'm sorry, at the end of World War II, it was 91 million, sorry. But, um, you know, there are many pictures of people celebrating the Armistice Day, and you can imagine, you know, that, that was certainly something to celebrate. But there's, there are also some kind of haunting photos of soldiers very near the front who just dropped their packs, didn't clap, didn't cheer, they just sank exhausted against their packs. And I, I'd, I'd like us to just go back to that ending of World War I by using an audio tape. It's a really unusual audio tape that's uh, stored in the Smithsonian. And um, thank you, Bill, for helping us listen to this tape. You have to listen pretty carefully. It's exactly the 11th minute of the 11th hour of the 11th day of November. And uh, you hear the guns and the explosions, and then you don't hear them, and then listen. Okay, uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is what they're using to recreate that sound. This is an actual film strip that they created on a machine in the 1919 at the end of the war, 1918 at the end of the war. They used 35 millimeter film strips and they were able to describe these little lines you can see on here, like seismographic lines. Each one was a different frequency of sound. They created these machines and would uh, install them in an arc behind the lines 
so that they could uh, track when the uh, blast of light happened and then follow that with the, um, here we are. This is the machines. They had several of these set back there and here's the film reel. The blast of light would go off. They'd record the light, they'd record that sound and then develop it on, this, on, this, on site. And within five minutes, they could utilize this to figure out exactly where the bombs were coming from. So then they would use that to target and reply. Now these sounds, they were able to analyze this and they recreated those and they made a, a, a full, uh, full fidelity recreation of the sounds that would have been happening at that time that this film strip was being recorded. And this is what they would have heard for the last minute of World War I. Thank you, Bill. So at the end, you can hear the bird song. I have been so moved by Vera Britton's book, A Testament of Youth. And she was an Oxford student. She was unusual because she was a woman accepted at Oxford and she was studying with her brother, Edward and her fiance, Roland, and it was a wonderful life. And they all became enamored with World War I. They were so patriotic, they couldn't wait to support the war and be the generation that would do their duty and march off to war. And so her brother and her fiance looked very dashing in their uniforms and off they went to the front. And she was so afraid that they would have experiences that she wouldn't share in. They were so close. So she volunteered as a nurse. And as you can imagine at the front, those young people very soon became very unenamored by the war. Vera writes that at one point she was assisting at a surgery and, and a, just a tortured young soldier uh, was you know, in, in great pain and, and, and she looked at her hands and they were covered with blood and, and she asked herself, will I ever laugh again? She talked about one time when she saw some soldiers who were walking and they, they stood upright and they, they looked healthy. They weren't haggard and ruined. And, and then she realized, oh, those are the US recruits. Her brother was killed. Her fiance was killed. Two of their closest friends in their circle were also killed. And she and another nurse, very shortly after they were no longer volunteers, decided that they should go to Germany. And Vera's book includes her travel through German cities where she realized, oh, civilians are suffering as badly as we did. They're homeless and they're hungry. And I think that's the cue for us to slow down, to listen and hear the consequences of our wars to put a human face always on the people who mean us no harm, but bear the brunt of these wars. And then guided by these kinds of mentors, uh, we have to move away from this threatening tinderbox that could bring about an end to the planet. And there's just no way that we can have a rational discussion about dealing with the very real terrors we do face, the terrors of climate catastrophe, the terrors of pandemic, 
the terrors of nuclear weapons unless we find ways to dismantle the militarism. So it's a big task. Um, but I believe that we catch courage from one another. And I certainly felt encouraged by this invitation to be with you this evening. So I am, oh my goodness, I've gone on for an hour. I hope that some of you can stay longer so that we can hear from others. There are lots of good mentors on this call. Thank you, Mabel Leone, for joining us all the way from upstate New York. And um, uh, please feel free to give your comments, your questions, your ideas, criticisms, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, I would encourage people to uh, go down to reactions and raise your hand so that you can go to the front of the line and then we'll know who's next with their questions. I have a question. Do you what do you have another trip planned? When will that be? And um, where? Well, you know, Jean, in this time of COVID, um, I haven't traveled, uh, gosh, since 2019. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure what to do. Uh, you know, it, we would put people at risk were we to visit them in Afghanistan. I'm banned from mentoring Pakistan. It's a long story. Um, so at the moment, I've been, like all of you, relying on Zoom and a great deal of letter writing. I am constantly writing letters. Uh, Sherry Moran has joined the call and she and I and others have tried to be buddies to people who are quite stuck in Pakistan. They fled Afghanistan, fled for their lives, and now they're in Pakistan and um, the Pakistanis don't want more people to come. So they've made some pretty stringent, difficult rules. Uh, and it's uh, these young people really right now don't have ways to work. They don't have ways to receive income because it's so difficult to get money to them. And they also don't have ways out. But fortunately, things have shifted a little bit and it may be that nine of them can get to Portugal in the very near future. We've had to tell them the dispiriting and disappointing news that the countries that they so much wanna to go to where they have Western friends, namely the US, the UK, Canada, and Australia, are the ones where it's least likely that they would be received. So um, that's, um, it, it, it's quite an operation. We have 117 people on a list and a really good gathering of internationals that meets about twice a week. And um, so th th there's quite a lot of reason for desk work, but I, I, I feel myself quite torn. You know, I, I I still believe that where you stand really determines what you see. So thank you for asking that. Bill? I was just gonna ask, I, you get to talk uh, quite a bit. I don't know how often you've given presentations on this particular issue, the, the current uh, drone warfare, um, but we're talking to us, how, what's the most individual powerful person you've spoken to? Have you spoken to Senator Durman and Tammy Duckworth or anybody in the administration? Do you ever have conversations with anyone like that? Well, I have spoken with Jan Schakowsky and she has been very welcoming to us to come to her office and sit down and she'll sit face to face with us, particularly in Chicago. In Washington, D.C., um, I've spoken with the aides to Tammy Duckworth and um, Senator Durbin, uh, I, I think we just always have to keep trying. We can't give up on the legislative effort. We can't give up on efforts to influence the executive or the judicial. Uh, I'm not sure uh, where the most powerful levers are right now. I mean, certainly what the New York Times did recently in printing the civilian casualties files and then staying with it. You know, they've been like you know, little pit bulls almost. Uh, that's important. And, and we do have connections with people who are reporting for the New York Times. And we, we really try to cultivate those connections. Now, quite honestly, when I've been in a war zone and there are other journalists around, until, before the guns start blasting or an occupation commences, 
it's all friendly. Um, uh, there's, there's a good spirit of camaraderie. But once the war starts, you become a ghost. And these journalists, you know, they do not want to have a bunch of peace activists uh, competing with them for the stories they're going to file. That's been my experience in actual war zones. But in a place like Afghanistan, in Kabul, you know, there, it was a war zone, but the, 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 you know, the bombs weren't exploding every day. You could talk quite a bit with the journalists and get to know them. So I have a great deal of respect for Matt Aikens, A-I-K-I-N-S, working for the New York Times. That was his Twitter feed that I drew those photographs from. And then I also strongly recommend Jeffrey Stern, Jeffrey E. Stern. Uh, he wrote a book about his experience in Kabul, but also he wrote a very compelling article um, from Arizona to Arhab, uh, the, following the journey of the United States manufactured weapon. And he takes it right to a little tiny town where people who had been celebrating because they dug a well, and they, you know, they hit water. And then they were hit by one of these drones that night. And it's so moving. He ends the story with his hand on the cheek of the man who's telling this long story. And he said it was really quite something that he had followed the pathway of a bomb from Arizona to the cheekbone of a man in a tiny village who thought he had something to celebrate. And the shrapnel from the bomb was in his eye and his cheekbone and his jaw. So there are some very brave people working in the media. USA Today has done some excellent reports. Um, and I think that we should keep trying to, as I say, cultivate those sorts of contacts. And I know that many, many of you do. Bill? Oh, oh excuse well, me. Yeah, uh, David and Jan, I think you're next. Uh, thanks for your powerful uh, presentation, Kathy. I understand you're helping start a, uh, a, a new campaign on ban killer drones. And if you could share with us uh, the strategy for this campaign and what people in churches and people of conscience around the country can do to uh, stop this madness. Mm, well, thank you, David and Jan. You know, um, the, the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons is one of the best things that's happened in my lifetime. And that is the result of a lot of determined work by grassroots people, not powerful people, grassroots people. And finally, they were able to get a treaty passed which would prohibit nuclear weapons. And um, once that's ratified in a country not only signs it, but ratifies it, then it becomes the law of the land of that country. If you're over in Ireland and you're nabbed for developing, storing, selling anything to do with a nuclear weapon, you could go to prison for the rest of your life. That's in the Irish law. So we're looking now for a treaty for the prohibition of weaponized drones. And you know, when people start to think about how easily accessible these weaponized drones are becoming and how much they increase the likelihood of people going to war and how accelerated the proliferation of these weapons is becoming, it might be that we'll, you know, get a little further with this treaty than I normally would expect. And so the idea is to work on a grassroots level to get faith-based groups, community groups, university groups, to inform their own groups more about drone attacks, and then to work on the different kinds of strategies to actually get this treaty passed. The Germans are remarkable for their public discussion about whether or not to acquire weaponized drones. It's had a long history, it's gone on for five years, but it's coming up in, because now the German Green Party is actually moving into power. So one thing all of us could do, and it's really very important, is to write to the German parliamentarians and say, look, we think what you're doing is great. Keep this discussion going and decide not to acquire weaponized drones. And uh, on the website, bankillerdrones.org, 
you can get a great deal of information about this, or um, I will put my email address in the chat and welcome anybody to get in touch with me further. The other thing we have are postcards that can be signed and then sent to Antonio Guterres in the United Nations. And um, they're, they're well-designed postcards and really pushing him to do all that he can do. And then um, there's a, an, an, a remarkable rendition of a drone uh, on the High Line Plinth in New York City. And it doesn't show weapons in the belly of the drone, but if you have any New York friends, maybe encourage them on a Saturday afternoon to go to the High Line Plinth and there meet with our friends who are protesting drone warfare. You know, one of our friends in New York is a professor, uh, a young Iraqi professor. And when his brother was killed, he took the very unusual step of um, asking a tattoo artist to tattoo on his back the names of every one of the Iraqis who had been killed by aerial strikes. And those are all tattooed on his back. And before that, when he was in Chicago, he put himself in a cubicle and set up a paint gun. And people remotely could target him with this paint gun. And 65,000 people tried over the course of a month to shoot Wafa Bala with a paint gun. And then you, know, you could try to divert the paint gun and send the pellet in another direction. So you know, those are the kinds of brave actions we've seen people take. And I'm sure there will be more to come, but certainly in our communities, we can take the actions of writing letters to the editor, of getting in touch with our elected representatives, write to the German Bundestag. Um, and then um, Mary Shesgren has been so great in organizing people to be out on street corners uh, out in the Western suburbs. And so to join those kinds of gatherings is very important. And then, you know, members of this group, Band Killer Drones, we'll talk with anybody, um, anytime. Uh, so please don't hesitate to be in touch with us for that. Uh, Bill, Bill Hartman, you have a question. Thank you. People, please yes. remember to mute yourself if you're not asking a question. Yes. Hi, Kathy, and uh, greetings, everyone. So, um, so, so important what you've shared and what we've listened to and seen. Um, I've known Kathy for a while. We were out in front of the UN before the pandemic started in 2019, before the children of Yemen and vigiled on the streets of New York City for a week while we were fasting. I'm also reminded that Ellen Grady and other Grady members of the family and many other friends vigil at the Hancock drone base in upstate New York. If anyone's from New York State and can get out to the Hancock base, folks are vigiling there and they continue to go out even with COVID. And also in Pennsylvania, in an area called Willow Grove Horsham, there was a, a naval base there, there an uh, air base that was downsized, uh, but it's now a drone launch base and they've trained pilots there. So Brandywine Peace Community does show up there um, during parts of the year to vigil outside of the base and let people know passing by that this is an active base where launchings take place. Um, it, I'm reminded though also, Kat, Kat, that we've had friends like Maya Evans in England to kind of pull together other friends on an international level to start to put together a plan of action to kind of go after not only the military systems, which are so dedicated to whatever the latest technology is, but also our own technology companies like the Elon Musks and others who are so dedicated to kind of creating more and more technology, but it will be the death of people because of their development and use of technology. It's becoming a death sentence for our societies around the world. Um, and finally, I was, when you were talking about World War I, I would just bring up the fact that they're at, in Philly before pandemic time, so this would have been around 2017, there was a, an art exhibit at the Pennsylvania Fine Arts Academy on Broad at Cherry on World War I. And there were many pictures of many images, but one thing that struck me so hard was besides the eight and a half million 
people, men, women, who were killed in, as soldiers at that time, there were over 8 million horses, donkeys, and um, mules that died during the four years of that war. 8 million of those creatures also died from so much of the violence and the just the terrible scenario of what they were struggling with. So I think we need to go out to try and deal with, and, and also getting on radio shows and talking to people, bring it up. Figure, you know, get your talking points, two or three points, and just get onto a show and talk. I've been on, for example, on Sirius XM, I've been on with Tom Hartman talking about some of our work in New York, as well as on John Fugelsang's show on the radio and talking about Plowshare's actions. So we should all try to do that as well and just get your one or two talking points and get onto a radio show and talk about drone warfare and the death of pe innocent people. And finally, maybe we could find a way to get that video that you showed of the pilots who were talking it up and getting ready to execute so many people um, and find some way to get it to recruiting stations. And this is what your people are doing. Kind of show it to people because it's such a um, horrendous image to kind of watch and see. I mean, it's already long past, but just to know that lives were wiped away and blittery, you know, smittered into blitterines. So. I'll stop there, but thank you so much, Kathy, for letting me join you. Oh, thank you, Bill. Um, you know, another effort we're thinking about undertaking uh, is to have an international tribunal and um, bring together people who are victims of drone warfare from Iraq, from Syria, from Afghanistan to give the testimony and have people who's uh, wisdom is widely acknowledged to be the judges. However, those are quite, quite expensive undertakings. And it's hard for us to imagine that, you know, that expense is warranted when there's so many other things that um, require great, great funds. So I'm not sure we're the people to do that, but we, we, we feel sure it is a good thing to do. So we're still exploring that. Um, So I, we really appreciate your, your sharing all of this with us, uh, giving us some ideas for uh, next steps that we can take. And um, unless I see any more hands, I, I think we will we'll let you go. But, but thank you so much for all that you do for, for your passion, your life's work, and, and for sharing it with us tonight. Well, I'm very grateful to have been with all of you. I, I often think after a presentation that people could bill me for therapy um, because I think that is kind of how we we press on. You know, we, we tell the stories as we know them and we, we challenge our own consciences. So uh, I want to say special thanks to each one of you for coming. I wish that sometime we could all meet one another in person and maybe sometime that will happen. But till then, I surely wish each of you the best. I did put my email in the chat and I see Bill's got his hand there. One more item, I, Kathy, maybe two months ago, I had you on for a Zoom little meeting with some folks in Camden, New Jersey, part of Sacred Heart Peace Ministries team there at the church where Michael Doyle was from. and. They have, they just shared on a Saturday night liturgy gathering we had that they've gotten an okay to move forward with taking an Afghan family and taking care of them, getting them set up to live in the uh, area around Camden. They're going to find a, a, actually a friend, John Levy, who is a lawyer, is going to share his upstairs third floor of the house with them to live there. So they'll have their own space to live in. It won't have to be a rental for probably six months or a year that he would give them that access. Um, but they're gonna try and get them set up um, in the next two weeks, I believe. That's so I just wanted to share that news. All right. Thank you. Bill Kale, final sure. parting words. I was just gonna mention, we'll, we'll gather up all of the resources we can with this and send it and we'll email it all back out to everyone that received an invitation for tonight's show. So you should be able to have all of that. Well, and thank, thank you, you thank you again, Kathy, for coming tonight. This has been a wonderful, a wonderful presentation. I think uh, we all have learned a lot and it was all valuable, all very, very valuable. Thank you. Thank you again. Next, next month, next month on the fourth Monday, we'll be uh, seeing a recording of uh, 
uh, about the color of law. And uh, uh, it's particularly focusing on how affordable, well, how housing laws have discriminated uh, historically in, in the US. And so please join us on February 28th for that. And once again, thank you so much, Kathy, for being with us tonight. All right. Bye-bye now.